This is an H16 engine. Yep, when others were designing V8 to V12, BRM went mad and designed a 3-litre H16 engine. And it was genius, allowing for more power and better weight distribution than other engines. However, all of that was in theory. The reality was an engine with incredible potential, but it loved to blow up. So why did they look at the V8s and V12s and go, nah, I'll have an H16, please? So in 1965, the engine regulations were weak. For this period, the engines had gone down to a maximum displacement of 1.5 litres from 2.5 litres before that. And a 1.5 litre naturally aspirated engine is never going to be that powerful. Cars produced 150 to 225 horsepower at the time, meaning that the Le Mans sports cars of the time were way faster. BRM British Racing Motors were running a 1.5 litre 16 valve V8, which was performing well. With such a small capacity the engine had to be super efficient and they had to spend a lot of time developing the engine and making sure the combustion chamber was as effective as possible but in 1966 formula one then moved to three liters increasing power by a lot. So every team had to design a new engine to suit the new regulations and they all went in different directions. Absolutely amazing. Ferrari ran a 60 degree V12, Honda ran a 90 degree V12, McLaren ran a Ford V8 engine and Repco designed their own V8. But the V12 seemed to be the way to go, producing around 100 horsepower more than the V8s. BRM made one of the boldest calls in F1 history. They made an H16. But how did they get to that idea? They looked into a V8 which would be nice and compact but we need to rev to 10,000 RPM to produce comparable power to the V12s and that kind of rev range was tough to achieve with the materials at the time. They also looked into a V24. Yep, a V24. And that got them more power but was just way too long to fit into their existing chassis. Imagine two V12s end to end. So the two remaining options were a 12 cylinder or 16 cylinder engine and the team actually hedged their bets and had a team working on each. But first, why were the teams pushing so many cylinders. It's actually easy to explain the other way. So imagine making a three litre one cylinder engine. The piston would be really heavy. The con rod would then need beefing up and the same with the crankshaft. Meaning that the torque would be high, everything is heavy, it would tear itself to pieces if it revs too high. If you add cylinders, each assembly gets smaller and lighter. You have less reciprocating mass, meaning you can rev the engine higher. And in a small naturally aspirated F1 engine, this is what you want. However, it does mean that the components get weaker, but that's the dance. Lightweight against strength. More cylinders also mean more valves, but typically they allow for freer flow through the engine. 12 cylinder team began working on a V12, and the 16 cylinder team started with a V16. But there was a problem. The engine was verging on being too long, and they were worried about bending the crankshaft. As you make the engine longer and longer, you put more and more strain on the crankshaft, meaning they were getting heavier, limiting engine revs and increasing the likelihood of bending them. But really, the main issue was around the length of the engine. A V16 would be too long, as would a flat 16. But the engineers, as always, got creative and came up with an H16. And this engine is mental. They essentially took their 1.5 litre V8 from the year before and flattened it, making a kind of flat 8. They then took two of these and stacked them on top of each other in the car, making a formation that looks like a capital H. So they named it the BRM H16. It meant it was short enough to fit in the car and gave them the power figure they wanted. Look at this shot of the cylinders. It's literally two cylinder blocks cast together. But to get this to work, Work, they needed to narrow the engine right up so the engine wouldn't be too tall. They brought the valves in with a narrower valve angle and had to get creative with the inlet and exhaust. But we'll come back to that later. But some of you would have noticed this, a tiny gear in the middle of the engine. So with these two engines fused together, you have two crankshafts and you can't drive one gearbox with two crankshafts. So they added a small idler gear to link the two crankshafts together. And then the gearbox would be driven off the lower crank. Now you can see that this thing is getting complicated. So with this design coming together, let's go back to the battle of the engines. The V12 team estimated their engine could produce 475 horsepower, with the engine being 30 inches long. That's three quarters of a meter, and it was going to weigh about 160 kilos. Then the H16 team reckoned their engine
engine was going to produce 5 to 600 horsepower with a length of 24 inches and weighing 170 kilos, meaning it was slightly heavier but produced more power and was easier to package in the car. It came with other benefits too. The H16 would be able to be used as a stressed member in the chassis, whereas the V12 couldn't. This is where the engine essentially forms part of the chassis, so the suspension is mounted straight onto the engine, rather than a separate chassis that the engine would sit inside. So BRM went for it. They made the first H16 engine ever, and it was possibly the most overcomplicated engine design in F1 history. In F1 terms, a V12 is complex, but it's nothing compared to this H16. And it all stems from the fact that it's essentially two engines in one. The first challenge was getting air in and out of this thing. A flat engine like a Subaru or a Porsche typically has air coming in the top of the engine and exhaust coming out of the bottom. But this becomes an issue when two engines are stacked together, giving the exhaust nowhere to go. So the BRM engineers move the inlet trumpets to the top of the head and then the exhaust coming out the side and it gave the final car a really weird look. You can see the inlet trumpets on the side of the car. Then you see the bizarre exhaust setup with two pipes out of the top of the engine and two out of the bottom. Then to activate the valves, they needed eight camshafts Yes, eight camshafts. On top of that, it had 16 throttle bodies, 64 valves, and two oil coolers. The numbers were mad. And of course, you can see the complexity stacking up here. Then think about coolant. They managed to join the coolant channels together so that the coolant was shared across the two engines, but it needed two water pumps to keep the pressure high enough. Then the oil was a similar thing. They managed to join the two engines together, but needed roughly double the oil of a V12 competitor engine. But they did get the H16 working. During the design phase, they were estimating five to 600 horsepower, which was game changing. The Ferrari V12 at the time was running around 400 horsepower and the Honda was doing about 380. But the BRM engineers did know that their engine was going to be a little bit heavier. However, they were soon shocked to see how far off their guesses were. First, the weight. For context, the Ferrari V12 weighed 130 kilo. The BRM came out at 250, almost double. And when Lotus took delivery of their first H16, it took six men to carry it into the workshop. But that's okay, as the power would more than make up for it. Well, the power only came out at 400 horsepower, so no more than the Ferrari. On top of that, and as you can imagine, with such a complicated design, the engine was extremely unreliable. During testing, the engines just kept blowing up, even at engine speeds as little as 2000 RPM. They eventually figured out it was a vibration issue coming from the crank. Shafts, so they added weights to the cranks to eliminate these issues. Then during early races, they had issues where the weights would come off the crank, circulate in the oil, then cause the engine to blow up. And there's more. BRM used cast iron cylinder liners as they were a quarter of the cost of steel and produced marginally more power. But as they revved the engine higher, sometimes the valves wouldn't return in time and they would hit the piston. And of course, this is an issue. But if only done a couple of times, the engine is normally okay. In this case, that would cause the cylinder liners to shatter. The piston would flail around and then the engine would blow up. Long story short, they like to blow up. But there was even more to this story. The driver's really didn't like the extra weight, but it was more that the weight was high in the car, raising the center of gravity and ruining what handling the car had. Then there was the fact that the car drank fuel, using upwards of 10% more than the equivalent V12. That meant that the fuel tank in turn had to be larger, which meant they had to push the engine even further back over the rear wheels, and that ruined the handling even more. Jackie Stewart said it was unnecessarily large, used more fuel, carried more oil, and needed more water. All of of which added weight and diminished the vehicle's agility. Despite this, they did get the engine to rev to an impressive 10,500 RPM, and it made a great sound. Just listen to this. <laughs> It kind of sounds like a Subaru, but screaming like a proper F1 engine. It's a really interesting noise. Anyway, you won't be surprised to hear that the engine wasn't that competitive. It was okay on raw grunt, but it just didn't like finishing races. In fact, it retired from 30 of its 40 races. It did win one race, Watkins Glen, but that was when the unit was in the back of the Lotus, after Colin Chapman bought the engine to fill the gap before his next engine was finished. The next year, BRM went back to a V12, and later in the 90s, F1 engine engineers got these engines up to 20,000 RPM. And we made a video all about that just here. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.